If we look at the basic definition of what design thinking is by Tim Brown, he says it's a human-centered approach to innovation that draws from the designer's toolkit to integrate the needs of people, the possibilities of technology, and the requirements for business success. So it says it's a human-centered approach to innovation. So would underline human-centered approach, would underline innovation. You draw from the designer's toolkit and to integrate the needs of people. So once you are going to be talking about customers, you should also have at the back of your mind that there's also supposed to be a need. And in terms of need, need can come from two ways. The business owner can generate the need for the product or a customer can generate the need for a product. So the business owner changing the need, that is not reverse engineering, but that is forward engineering. So you design a product and you go to the customer to use. The customer would give you feedback and then the customer would say, yes, I like it. Then you go into mass production. Or if the need is going to come from a customer, you identify through collecting customer information, you identify what that need is, and then you create or design a product to satisfy that particular need. You, use, you need to have the use of technology in, in, in you doing design. And then that is what is going to ensure your success as a business would we'll borrow the second definition of design thinking from our own uh, Dr. Gordon, uh, Gordon Adomja. He's uh, one of the founding members of Design Thinking Ghana. He says it's a problem-solving approach that is user-centered. So a problem-solving approach that is user-centered. It takes a system's perspe perspective sorry, and often leads to creative outcomes. So you're taking a problem-solving approach that is user-centered, takes a system's perspective, and often leads to creative outcome. So I would wanted to show this, what um, Arnie was talking about in terms of making new connections. So starting from understanding what the problem is, observing it, points of view, you need to ideate, you prototype, and you test. So basically, you are looking at some form of reversing from the problem and then fasting forward and then coming back to the process of gathering thoughts, going forward to points of view, coming back to points of view and going back into the ideation process and then you prototype and then you test. Now, um, has anybody heard of the term VUCA? If you're doing design thinking, you should have, not you. <laughs> have you heard of the term VUCA? Okay, VUCA basically stands for volatility, ambiguity, Sorry, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So it says the current business environment that we are in is volatile. So if you take the industry that you are in, irrespective of whether it's technology, it's fintech, it's tourism, it's medicine, whatever, it's a very volatile industry. I would give examples around the industry that I'm familiar with, which is telecoms, to drum home my point. But if you take any industry today, a um, couple of years ago, when we went to hospitals, you need to carry your folder. In fact, till date in, in some hospitals, you need to carry your folder under your armpits when you're going to visit the doctor. But there are hospitals today in Ghana who have completely automated their process end to end. So you don't need to go in with a card. You just go in and you mention your name or you mention your date of birth. They look out for a keyword and they check you in. 
Nobody needs to come and stand and call you. There's a ticketing system that has been implemented. So once your ticket number comes over there, it pulls. By the time you walk into the consulting room, your information is actually on display. So irrespective of the industry that you are in, it's volatile. Things will change. If things don't change from your point of view, things will change from the customer's point of view. Because if I go to a hospital that I don't need to carry my medical records, and I would have to visit another hospital where I have to be carrying medical records, with the, uh, if you're in the rainy season, the probability of it getting wet or getting missing or getting lost, or somebody misplacing those documents, I'd rather shift as a customer move to a hospital that gives me better experience. So today, organizations are selling experience. They are not selling their core product. If it is about a core product, everybody else can design that same core product, but they are selling experience. So if you go into some organizations, people are being overtly nice to you because they've realized that there are a lot of competing products that would serve the need of the customer. And once there are competition or once there is competition, you need to understand that you need to innovate to stay in competitive advantage. So our world again has become uncertain. So 20 years ago, we did not predict this was, go this was going to happen. Today, as Arani said, will not be able to predict what's going to happen in 20 years. But you need to have a view of what's going to happen in future. So in response to one of the questions that uh, the gentleman asked um, downstairs, if I take my business, for instance, I'm in a business where I see a lot of disruptions every day. I'm a telecom service provider. I provide access. So I provide access for people to connect. I provide access for people to be able to talk to one another. I provide access for people to be able to see one another in terms of communication. So I'm just a pipe, I'm just a channel. There are a lot of businesses that are coming up around what I do, which I call, or which is termed as over the top technologies, OTTs. So if you take WhatsApp, for instance, WhatsApp is based in the United States of America. They've designed an app that allows you and you to connect. 10 years ago, if you're going to talk about connection, you need to pick a call, a phone, and make that phone call for it to connect. Or you need to send an SMS. Fast forward 15 years from now, we have 5G that we are testing. So we moved in terms of technology, we've evolved from the basic 2G, which was only voice and SMS. We moved to 2.5G, which is Edge, when we started doing basic GPRS, data sending and receiving of messages. Then we moved into 3G and 4G, and we are now testing 5G, which is quadrupling the speed of transmitting data. Now, if I sit where I sit and I say, what's up is in the United States of America, it has no impact on my business, then I'm, I'm, I'm living in, in a vacuum or in a bubble that when it bursts is going to drown my business. Because whether I like it or not as a business, my customers, which includes all of you, will need that service. As soon as WhatsApp caught on, everybody said, okay, I want WhatsApp. So as a service provider that's a channel, I need to go and sit down and find out how I can still stay in business whilst giving my customers that particular satisfaction in terms of the need to communicate. So I sit and I say, okay, let me design what I call a WhatsApp bundle for you. you so you pay one Ghana, two Ghana, three Ghana, and you'd be able to do your WhatsApp. But if I sit and say, I'm not gaining anything from WhatsApp because WhatsApp is certainly not gonna pay my business for the transmitting of that information, I need to find a way to monetize it, monetize that conversation. And that is where the, the difficulty lies for a lot of businesses. They are unable to understand 
the uncertainty surrounding their business ecosystem, and then finding a way to monetize that interaction. So it goes back to the need, understanding what the customer's need is, and find out what the customer considers as value. So today, if you are going to do FaceTime, or if you are going to do a video call using Skype, the customer's need is to be able to see his colleague who is in, let's say, Borga, to have a business meeting. So that's the need. So I need to sit down and find a way how I can monetize that. Because Skype is not going to give me, as a channel, anything. So I need to find out what she considers as value and what he considers as value. Network stability. So if he's calling, he wants to see her and she wants to see him. So that's value for the customer. They don't want to have breaks. So they don't want to be hearing that electric sound in the communication. So that is what he considers as value. So I need to go back, look at my existing technology, and see if my existing technology would be able to support that. If not, I need to invest in technology that would be able to give my customers value. And then if I put a premium, which is the price, on that conversation, then both of my customers would be willing to pay for that. We said there is a lot of ambiguity in the business environment. A lot of things change. From regulatory, if you're working in an industry such as mine, where you have multiple regulators, so you have the National Communications Authority regulating you on the mobile side, and then you have the central bank regulating you on the mobile financial side. You have that complexity of satisfying the need and the requirements for both of these regulators. So in the same way, if you're working in tourism, if you're working in healthcare, that you would have that complexity within that environment where you need to satisfy certain basic law requirements. I'm not too familiar with um, the health environment, but sanitation and keeping the place healthy, I believe, is one of the key things that you should be looking out for. So how would I ensure that my business environment is one safe for my employees, two is safe for my customers, so that you don't end up on the bad side of, um, what do you call it, um, your regulators. So basically we are saying design thinking is the, at the midpoint between analytical thinking and intuitive thinking. So intuition has to do with hunches. There are times that you are going to take a decision and you can feel something within you telling you that, okay, this is right or this is wrong. So that's a hunch. That's intuitive thinking. And analytical thinking is looking out for facts. So you're looking for the facts and numbers to arrive at your decision. But design thinking is at the midpoint of the two. So it combines both analytical thinking and intuitive thinking. So it's sort of a 50-50 of both. OK. Um, it's a shame the projector is still not up on, but OK. So on MPS, sorry. Yes. C, that's complexity. So um, we are in uh, environment where you would have a lot of interdependent relationship. You have matrix relationship. Whatever environment that you are in would have a lot of supporting businesses around you. So if you are into tourism, in terms of complexity, you are a facilitator, you are a vehicle, you drive people from one place to another. You need to first identify locations. So that person, who has a building or is managing a particular site needs to understand that that site would have customers coming to them. So he needs to keep the place well. So that is one aspect of your business. If you are going to travel to that destination, though you would require a vehicle, you would require transportation. So those in the transportation industry are also your stakeholders. They are part of your ecosystem. Now, if there are increases in fuel, certainly 
that is going to increase the cost of transportation to whatever destination you are taking your customers. And whoever is there, assuming electricity is also unstable and he needs to put on the generator, that is also going to impact on his cost of operation. So he must increase the cost of entry. And you who is looking at the entire ecosystem, the entire chain from beginning to end, you need to look at how you are also going to make your margins. So in terms of complexity, there are things that you have control over which are very peculiar to your business, but a lot of the things you do not have control over. So because of that complex nature of uh, business environments now, it, it, it makes um, innovation very critical. It makes fast-forwarding thinking very important. It makes you understanding and collecting customer information to make your business competitive much more important and much more critical. So basically that is um, what is um, that around the complexity. So World Park DT now. MPS, it was a concept that was introduced by a company called uh, Bain and & Company and another company called Sad Matrix. Um, they developed this concept sometime um, around 2003, where they published an article in the Harvard Business Review, which says, which was titled, One Number You Need to Grow. It's a very simple metric, a very simple number. They, they titled their article, One Number You Need to Grow. And they defined Net Promoter Score as a management tool that can be used to gauge the loyalty of a firm's customer relationships. So the net promoter score or the NPS is a management tool that can be used to gauge the loyalty of a firm's customer relationships. So as I mentioned earlier, it's one of the tools that you'd be able to use to collect customer information. Aside that, in terms of uh, collecting customer information, traditionally, it used to be through collecting, uh, doing what we call the customer satisfaction uh, indexes report, or doing what we call a focus group discussion, where you bring a cross section of all your customers across all the various segments, and you ask them feedback about your, um, what do you call it, um, um, about your product or service. We would be looking at the reason why I chose the Net Promoter Score because of its simplicity and how easy it would be for you to gather that um, uh, customer information. And it gives you a very clear picture of whether your customers are going to enjoy your product or service or not. So we are saying the Net Promoter Score also measures the loyalty that exists between a provider and a consumer. So the provider can be anybody. It can be a company. It can be an employer. So if you're an employer, if you want to test whether your employees love your brand or not, you can use this tool to ask them a very simple question, which we'll be coming to in the next slide, or any other entity. And then the consumer is a person who consumes your uh, product or service. It could be an employee or any respondent to the survey. So anybody who is within your ecosystem that you feel has got valuable inputs to give to you, then the person is a respondent to your survey. Now the question for the MPS is simple. They just ask, how likely is it that you would recommend our company, it could be a, our product, it could be our service, to a friend or a colleague? That is the net promoter question, MPS question. How likely is it that you would recommend our company, our product, our service to a friend or a colleague? And the scoring for this answer is given on a scale of 0 to 10. So the question is, how likely would you recommend my product, my service, or whatever that I'm giving you to a friend or a family or a colleague? 
and the rating scale is from 0 to 10. Now, after identifying or after getting that particular rating scale, your customers are now segmented into three, or your respondents will now be segmented into three. We've got those that we call the promoters, those who are going to cheer you on, those who would give, recommend your product and service to others. We've got those that we call the passives, so they are in between. They are not promoters, and they are not the third category, which is those that we call detractors. So you've got promoters, you've got passives, and you've got detractors. Now, those in, on the rating scale who score you between 9 and 10 are those that we call the promoters. Those who score between 7 and 8 are those that we call the passives. And those who score you between 0 and 6, we call them your detractors. So your promoters are customers who are going to be loyal to you. They are customers who would make repeat purchases. They are customers who would give service or who would recommend the service of the organization to their friends and family. They will talk about your brand to their friends and services. And we know in terms of cost of sale that for you to go out to acquire a completely new customer, it costs you five or six times if an existing customer will just recommend your product or service to somebody else. It would cost you five or six times. So coming back to my business again, before I would be able to sell one SIM card, I need to first produce that SIM card, which costs me over $5, import the SIM cards into the country, put what I call a welcome package on it. So all in all, that SIM card is going to cost me around $10, but I have to sell it at two CDs. And mind you, whoever is going to sell that SIM card on my behalf, which is my sales force, I need to pay them a salary if they will need a car to go to their location, I need to fuel that car. If the car breaks down, I need to fix that car. So all of these feeds into my cost of sales. But it would be easy for me to make a promoter of David and then tell David that, would you recommend my service to Judith? My cost of sales is zero. Completely zero. So whatever 10 or $20 that I put on costing of acquiring one customer, if I can get one individual to promote my business, it means that my cost of sale is zero. So that increases your uh, efficiency within the organization. It reduces your operating cost. And for every business, this scenario applies. Once even in circumstances of social impact initiatives, you still need people to hop on board. It's easier for you to get a movement when you are able to convince your friends and family to be able to join you rather than you going out there to recruit new people. So your promoters are people who would go out of their way to recommend your business, to recommend your service to their friends and family. And how do you measure that? Simple. How likely are you to recommend my business to somebody? We'll be looking at when to ask um, these, this question. So those that are the passives, those that are between 7 and 8, they are basically people who are neither promoters or detractors. So they are there in the middle. So we'll look at 
what would contribute to customers becoming passives about your product or service? Because it means that probably in terms of the functional requirement, the product is just an okay product. So you need to look at your functional requirement and your emotional requirements as well. Um, they are indifferent about your brand. So they are just okay, they are in the middle. It is easier for businesses to convert your promoters into, uh, sorry, your passives into your detract, uh, so into your promoters. So somebody who is not your cheerleader, he doesn't cheer you on on your product or your service, you would be able to convert, convert him to become a promoter by understanding the reason for him sort of sitting on the fence. 